Hi! In this video, I'm going to go over the Ford Fulkerson algorithm and try to develop an intuitive sense of how it works. I'll be going over the algorithm's use case and how to run it by hand. I won't be going over how to code it, though. There are plenty of other resources available online which do more than a good enough job of that. With that out of the way, let's get started. The Ford Fulkerson algorithm is used to find the maximum amount of flow that can go through a graph. If you don't have experience with the max flow problem, you can think of it as trying to figure out, given a network of pipes with one opening on either side, how much water or other liquid you could send through a system before one or more of the pipes is filled to capacity and the maximum amount of liquid flowing through the system has been reached. It may come as a surprise, then, that this maximum flow problem has applications in tons of different fields, from airline scheduling to optimizing task assignment to determining whether or not teams are eliminated from, a, from sports leagues, for instance, baseball, after a certain number of games have been played. After the Ford Fulkerson algorithm finishes, it gives us something called a minimum cut, which is essentially, drawing from the pipes analogy, exactly which pipes were filled to capacity. By looking at this min cut, we can actually verify that the solution is optimal. Here's an example of a graph that you might want to find the maximum flow of. There are six nodes, S, A, B, C, D, and T, and many edges. The numbers on these edges are the capacities, how many units of flow that they can hold. Two of the nodes, S and T, are special nodes. They're called the source and sink, respectively. Flow comes out of S and goes through the graph to T. The idea is to maximize the flow from S to T, or the ST flow through the graph. Here we define the input to the max flow problem, more formally, with set notation. This is essentially the same as what I just went over. We have nodes and edges, capacities for each of the edges, and a source and a sink. Now we define the output of the problem more formally. What we should get after running our algorithm is a set of flows x on each edge from node i to node j, and we should also be given our max flow amount. The mathematical notation may be a little hard to parse at first, but basically we're saying that the max flow is going to be the sum of all the flows into t. This should make intuitive sense. t is the sync node, so all the flow through the graph is going to have to go through to t. Later on, we'll see what this third thing is, the residual graph, and how it relates to a min cut. To begin, let's consider the naive approach that someone might come up with when first looking at the graph. All this approach does is find a path from S to T and push as much flow through it as possible. If it's not possible to find any more of these paths, it says that we have reached a maximum flow. We'll work through this approach and we'll see when it works, when it doesn't work, and how to correct it. Starting off, we find an ST path. This is highlighted in red. Now we find the, minimum, the maximum flow through the path. This is simply the minimum of all the capacities over the edges from S to A, A to B, and B to T. For this path, it's 3. So we send the flow of 3 through and update our graph. The flow through an edge is boxed, as shown. Now we come back to step 1 again and find another ST path, this time through the bottom of the graph instead of the top. This path's edges have a minimum capacity of 3, so the flow through the path will be 3. And so we update our graph again. And we're done! There aren't any more paths that we can send flow through. As you can see, there are specifically two edges which are stopping us from sending any more, since they're both filled to capacity. The edges from A to B, and from D to T. These edges constitute a minimum cut, that is, they are the minimum amount of capacity that we would have to cut to prevent any flow from the source from reaching the sink. Here, the minimum cut is more visible. There are some issues with this, though. We got very lucky in our choices. The algorithm only took two iterations. We definitely chose the optimal routes, and it was pretty easy to see that they were optimal when picking the routes. The issue is that we won't always be able to determine ahead of time which routes are the best ones to choose, and with our naive algorithm, not all of the routes will actually return optimal solutions. Now, let's try running our naive algorithm again with different choices so that we can pinpoint exactly where it breaks down. We'll start off with a different ST path this time. 
using a backwards edge that we had previously ignored. The minimum of these capacities is going to be the capacity of this new edge, so it'll be 2. Now we send the flow through and update. Here's another ST path. We didn't encounter this issue earlier, but it seems, but since it seems kind of obvious, we should make sure to subtract the amounts of flow that are already going through the edges from the capacities when calculating our minimum amount of flow. Here we're taking the minimum of 3, 4 minus 2, and 3 minus 2, which is 1. Now we send the flow through and update. And now let's look at the graph and find another ST path. With the same technique we used last time, we can see that the most flow that we can send through this path is one unit again. And we update again. And we're done. But something is off. We can't send any more flow through the graph because we have the same min cut over edges A, B, and D, T of 6. But unlike last time, our max flow isn't equal to our min cut. Instead, after adding up the flows coming into our sink T, we see that it's only 4. We need a way to fix the mistake that we made by sending two units of flow through that backwards edge from B to C. Here's the idea. Since we sent those two units of flow through the edge, we can also choose to not send them through the edge. If we simply sent the flow backwards along this green path and reduced the forwards flow from B to C by 2, we'd have the same exact optimal solution that we came up with earlier. So let's formalize this. Our approach is still very similar to the naive one, but with one major difference. This time, we're using something called a residual graph. We'll go over that in more detail when we reach that point in the algorithm, though. Let's just run through it for now. We'll start with the same flow as we did in the previous example. Again, the minimum of these capacities is 2. And we update our graph. Now we need to create the residual graph. This graph is exactly what it sounds like, a graph which displays the amount of residual flow or how much flow we can still send through each edge. The way it works is that we make two edges for each edge we're given, one forward and one backwards, which re represent the amount of flow we can send each way. Then we can just use these edges to determine how much capacity we can still send instead of computing the difference between the capacities of the edges in the path and the flows through them as we've been doing in our naive approach. In our formal definition of the residual graph, we create new backwards edges for each edge and set the capacities on the new edges and change the capacities on the old ones. We define this R sub ij as the residual of the edge from node i to node j, which is just the amount of flow that we can still send through the edge. This R sub ij will be the capacity of the forward edge and the amount that we can send backwards Will just be the current flow. It should become clear when we create the residual graph for our current graph. Here is, this, here is the residual graph after we've pushed our first flow through. The graph is the same at every edge except for those which have had flow pushed through them. The new backwards edges have capacities equal to the flow that was sent through. It's two for all the backwards edges along this row. Think of these backwards edges as being able to take back the flow that we've sent. The only real constraints on our flows is that they are between zero and our capacities. Since sending all the flow back through any edge is the same as resetting its total flow to zero, it should make sense that we can do this. Now, note that there isn't an edge from B to C. The reason for that is that we sent the maximum flow from through the B to C edge already, meaning that there is no extra capacity that remains. In other words, the residual is zero. Since an edge with zero capacity is of no use to us, we can simply choose not to draw it. Now, instead of finding a path through the original graph, we look through a path through the residual graph. The path that we've chosen here is the green one that we would have liked to have chosen back in our naive approach, but we're unable to choose since that approach didn't support backwards edges. The minimum amount of flow through this path is two. And here we have our updated graph. The flow through the BC edge is zero because we sent back the two units of flow that had previously been going through the edge. This graph should look more similar to the one that we had out in our first try in our naive, naive approach, the one that actually did manage to reach the optimal solution.
because it made the best choices. We have fixed our mistake of a suboptimal path choice and have done so within the confines of our algorithm. The rest of the choices should be pretty simple, even without the residual graph, but we'll run through them anyway to try and build an understanding of how the process works. Here is our residual graph after we pushed that last, throw, uh, that last flow through the path that we found. Here's another ST path, and the minimum capacity here is 1. Now we've reached a max flow of 5. And here's the residual graph. As you can see, we can't send any more flow through the DT edge, as it's only backwards from T. And the last flow, min capacity of 1. And here's the same set of optimal flows that we saw before. We need to draw the residual graph, however, to ensure that we're optimal. Here, the residual graph clearly demonstrates that we can't go through the AB or CB or DT edges, so we found a min cut, and here it is. Our max flow is 6. In order to actually calculate the min cut, though, we need to look at the original graph. As you can see here, the min cut goes through two forward edges with capacities of 3 and 3 meaning that the total min cut is 6. We don't count the backwards edge BC, as it doesn't go from S to T like the others do. And so, with that all done, let's review the main ideas of our algorithm. We learned that the ford fulkerson algorithm can be used to solve the max flow problem, which has applications in many diverse fields. The main concept that we've discovered was that backwards edges can be used to correct suboptimal paths. This will be useful if you're trying to code this up and don't have control over which path is chosen. And that's it. Thanks for watching. I hope you learned something.